You're all standing up for me, it's, uh, I, I appreciate. <laughs> Right. <coughs> so you see, uh, so uh, okay. So this was about the magnons, and uh, uh, I just concluded on the fact that you know magnons are lossy. And so this is why uh, we actually worked with different types of spins, and that really dilutes an ensemble of dilute paramagnetic impurities in a crystal. And so this is a. Uh, a research uh, project that uh, I've, I mean, has been going on in, in our group since 2010. And so uh, in this first experiment, we actually uh, looked indeed for strong coupling. S same, uh, we wanted to do this uh, same collective coupling with spins, uh, but uh, with uh, an ensemble of, uh, of uh, paramagnetic centers. Here we, we are using uh, NV centers in diamond. I don't really have time to talk a lot about them, but they are just, uh, if you want, uh, impurities in diamond with an electron spin. That's all you need to know. And so this was uh, our first device. We had, uh, you see the, the diamond, we just glued it on top of the superconducting chip. And here, this is just a, a resonator. Uh, you, you barely see, but... And uh, this resonator actually con contains some squids to make it frequency tunable. And so you, you can hear this with, with the squid. Squids are inductance that, that you can tune by uh, applying a flux through them. And so we had a, a, a little line that we can push pass current. And with this, we could see that uh, the resonator frequency is changing uh, quite a lot uh, by a few hundred megahertz. And so uh, NV centers actually at zero field have a resonance at 2.88 gigahertz. This is well known. Uh, and, and so this is why we designed this resonator to be uh, close to 2.88 gigahertz. And so uh, when we uh, passed through resonance, we observed some features. This was at, uh, and in addition, we can apply some magnetic fields in the plane of this, uh, of this device. And so we, we observed that, you know, on the tuning curve of the resonance, we saw some, some features, and, and this feature moves with magnetic field when we apply, say, one millitesla, we see this, uh, this is moving two millitesla also. And, and here, indeed, at each, uh, say, uh, these are really avoided level crossings between, say, a, a, a spin ensemble mode, which is shown here in dashed yellow, and the resonator uh, frequency. Okay, so so this was, uh, in fact, this was the first uh, demonstration of strong coupling between an ensemble of spins and the uh, and the resonator, uh, and we had a coupling constant of 10 megahertz uh, also. And we had 10 ppm of NV centers. And so that was uh, encouraging. And then we decided to, to go a step further. And here, here is the same remark as, as with the Magnon. Uh, this is, in fact, an ensemble of spins. This is a collective coupling. So in fact, it's a two, linear, two, two uh, uh, linear oscillators that are coupled. So nothing quantum. Of course, this was measured at low temperature. But at any temperature, we would have seen this, uh, uh, this spectrum, right? So then the next step was to incorporate a qubit in it. And so we, we did that in 2011 with my postdoc, Yui Kubo. And so we had a chip that was, uh, uh, again, a bit of, of the same kind. We have a, had a, a, a diamond glued on top of uh, this resonator, which is shown here in yellow. It's also frequency tunable. But this time, we had also a transparent qubit in red that is coupled to the resonator. And the transparent qubit, we can read it out uh, by standard readout. And so uh, when we would uh, uh, change, so we applied some, some magnetic field also to the NV centers. And when we change the, the flux to the squids, we tune the resonator frequency. And we see again these avoided level crossings. Uh, these are uh, at, uh, you know, I mean, there are four of them because of details of the NV center orientation, etc. It's not very important. What counts is that we have, again, these avoided level crossings with the uh, spin ensemble resonances. And then uh, we did time domain experiments, uh, because now we can excite the qubit. Um, 
And then you see that it, the resonator, if we go down in frequency, at the lower frequency, we have the qubit. And so now we did uh, experiments, like we, we excite the qubit with a pipers, this is completely standard, and then with the bus resonator, we catch this excitation in the qubit and we transfer it to the NV centers, and then we let the two systems evolve, and then we, we detune it, and, and we tune it back to the qubit because the, the one thing that you can measure the best is the qubit. So qubit is the best way to measure what has happened. And so this is the type of curve that we would observe. Uh, Oscillation, so this is the qubit excited state probability as a function of the interaction time of the, of the resonator with the NV resonance. This was, uh, here is frequency omega minus one, so is this one. Here is minus three, is this one. And so uh, you see that we have a, 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 a big change of excitation probability and so some small oscillation, but essentially some damping, very strong uh, decrease of the a qubit excitation probability with some little coherent oscillation. So, and, and this is shown here in the, uh, when you change the, the detuning, just to show that this is resonant with the, 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 the spin resonance frequency, right? And so, um, so what can we say? So, we, we, so in, this, in this paper we said, uh, yeah, so, so, so we, we really take, so what do we do here? We take one qubit excitation and we transfer it to the, this uh, collective mode of NV centers. Uh, and so this is interesting because indeed we, we prepare this mode in like one excitation state. But, but then after that, it, it can be recovered but very partially. Uh, and so in a sense, we, what, what this curve shows is that we can store this excitation in, in 100 nanoseconds. But after that, we only partially retrieve it and it's kind of lost in the spin ensemble. right? So this is very nice, but it's also a little bit disappointing in the sense that I told you that you know spins are very coherent systems and we can store it for long times, etc. But you know, after 100 nanoseconds, everything is gone. So what is happening? Well, what is happening is that uh, we have an ensemble of spins, but we have a phenomenon which is inhomogeneous broadening. And what is it? Well, we have an ensemble of spins, and they are in this crystal, and, and let's imagine that these are my NV centers in red. But you know, around each of these spins, there are other spins, uh, so, uh, yeah, and they have different spin environment. They see different spin around them. They also see different uh, electrostatic environment, and they also see different strain, and they all experience different local uh, environment, and all these results in a, a distribution of their resonance frequency. And so really, if you, if you plot the, 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 the density of spin as a function of frequency, it's not at all a single line. There is not a single spin frequency. All spins are different. And so it's more like a distribution around a central frequency with a certain width gamma. And so, uh, you know, there is this inhomogeneous broadening of the spin resonance, and this is intrinsic to spins in solids. This is always, always there. And uh, we can define some line widths gamma. And so, what, what is, how, how does this impact uh, this, this physics that I was describing of coupling to a spin ensemble? So, uh, th this is uh, interesting to, to, to see. Imagine first that there is no inhomogeneous broadening. All spins have the same frequency omega s, they are all identical. Then you have indeed this picture of a cavity mode coupled to this bright mode that I defined. You, you remember I defined this mode. It's really, B is really a sum of you know, G times uh, sigma, sigma minus, right? Or B dagger is, uh, uh, see, uh, Okay, there is a one over square root of n, but here there are phases in between each of these states, right? So, in fact, you have many, many modes, but you, you could have a minus sign here, and then you have another, another mode. So you have, in fact, you, you, ha you have one bright mode which is coupled to the cavity, but you have n minus one dark modes. n is big, huh? this is like you know, 10 to the 12. So you have a family of, of modes, that spin modes, that are not coupled to the resonator, because this is the only mode which is coupled to the, to the resonator. And, and so this is this, this vision that I was kind of uh, describing so far. But in reality, it's not like that. And so in, in this vision, you really have these two 
uh, coupled systems. They are coupled by this strong coupling uh, G ensemble. And, and these modes are dark. They are spectators, but they, they have no interaction with this closed system. So when you turn in homogeneous broadening, it's not like that anymore. Uh, because in fact, if you, if you write it, I, I could do it, but I don't really have time. But if you write now this, uh, these dark modes, and the, effective, uh, the effect of inhomogeneous broadening is basically to kind of uh, def change the phases of each spins in this superposition. So this effectively results in a coupling of this white mode to the dark modes. And so really, you have a, some kind of transfer. And this transfer occurs at a rate, which is precisely the inhomogeneous broadening of the, of the spin ensemble. So, in this, in this experiment that I just showed with the qubit, we have been, so now instead of the cavity, we had a qubit, we took the qubit, we transferred the photon to the bright mode, and in fact what happens is that this photon quickly decays towards this bath of dark mode, and then it's lost. You, 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 you don't see it anymore. And this is why we saw this decay. But is it really lost? Can we retrieve maybe this excitation from the dark modes? And the answer is yes. But for that, you need to do something else. And this is basically very analogous to what is happening in a Han echo, in a spin echo. Spin echo, you have, uh, you're probably all familiar with spin echo. Uh, in a spin echo, you, you, you apply a pi over 2 to, to, to the spins, right? Pi over 2 pearls, so they all go to the equator. And then they will dephase due to inhomogeneous broadening, exactly as we do, like with this uh, single photon excitation. Then you apply a pi pulse. And the pi pulse, in a sense, inverts the, the, the sense of the, the, the direction of time. And so all the spins will rephase uh, after a time 2 tau. And here, they all come back in phase. And they produce this echo. So can we use something similar in this context? Because after all, this is really the same problem. Huh? The, 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 the qubit excitation is still hidden there. So we should do some spin echo. So this is what we did then, because then we, we understand, understood that and we thought, okay, now this is really the basis for doing some real quantum memory protocol. And so here the idea is that uh, uh, you can send some, some pulses, maybe some quantum states. You have a, a spin ensemble in a cavity and then you can send some, some, some pulses. They will be uh, absorbed by the spin ensemble and transferred to the dark modes. And then you apply some refocusing pulse, and then they kind of come back as spin echoes, but spin echoes uh, just at a very low amplitude because now we have sent just a single photon or very few photons, right? So we want to do spin echo, but at a very, very weak excitation. And okay, so we thought it's maybe fun to try that. And this should extend the times really. Uh, and so this is what we did with uh, uh, so Cécile Grez. And, and so we had this uh, like simple LC resonator. And then again, we glue diamond on, the, on top. Uh, so here there was a, a little uh, complication is that we, we wanted to be able to repump the spins. Because when you do spin echo, uh, you excite a lot the spins. So you need them to relax before repeating the experiment. And this is actually difficult because uh, spins relax very, very slowly at low temperature. So in this experiment, we actually optically repump them at 10 millikelvin. But uh, so after we, we were able to do that, we could repeat the experiment. And then we could uh, send trains of microwave pulses to the system. And then you know they would be absorbed. So this is, this is what happens. This is the, the pulses that we send. And this is the reflected pulses. So you see that actually they are very well absorbed by the spin ensemble. Uh, so mean, meaning that the kind of this ensemble cooperativity is close to one because the, they are well, very well absorbed by the, the NV centers uh, ensemble. And so we apply this refocusing pulse. And there we go. We get our uh, echoes back. So these echoes were actually much smaller than the input pulses. So this is uh, it's not you want you would like them to be as high as, as possible, huh? as, high, as high as the initial pulses. But also, okay, we gained we, we were at 100 nanoseconds. So now we are it's better. We are at 10 microseconds. So this is much better. But still, it's not super great huh? because you see that these echo these they, they kind of decay over 10 microseconds. So why do they decay? Well, it's because OK, you have inhomogeneous broadening. I said you have this line, which is this distribution. But the environment is not static, not completely static. 
a large part of it is static, but for instance, the spin bath is very dynamic. Why is it so? It's because in the bath, so you know the bath is these blue spins, for instance. And now these blue spins, maybe you have two of them that are up and down, and they can flip-flop. So if they flip-flop, it means that the, 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 sp the spin bath, the, the, the local field felt by the spins will actually depend on time. And then uh, the effect of the refocusing of the echo will, will be lost, because if the phase acquired during the two parts of the echo are not the same, then the echo doesn't work. And so uh, then you see the, 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 the slow evolution of the spin bath causes spin dephasing and decay of the spin echo with a time T2. This is the, coherence, the spin coherence time. When, when people speak of spin coherence time, they speak of the T2, the echo decay time. And so here is the, is the time to notice some kind of intrinsic contradiction to this quantum memory scheme. Uh, and here you see that on the one hand, you need a large spin density because you want to absorb efficiently the microwaves that, that arrive. And this is related to this uh, collective coupling constant, the square root of n. So, well, let's have n large to, to increase the absorption. Yes, but if you do so, you run the risk that you will also have more spin-spin interactions, and so the coherence time of this spin ensemble may be lowered due to spin-spin interaction. So this is what we saw in this last experiment that I presented. So what do we do? Well, there is a solution. The solution is clock transitions. So, uh, and I will now explain, uh, so a last experiment where we uh, actually could demonstrate that. And so uh, before, like, I mean, showing you uh, these, how these clock transitions work, let me uh, describe you the system that we use and that actually dis displays these uh, clock transitions. And here we, uh, <coughs> we are using now, <coughs> we have switched uh, in this experiment from NV centers in diamonds to another spin system that I will now describe in slightly more detail, uh, which is bismuth donors in a silicon uh, lattice. So uh, this is silicon lattice. You can replace a silicon atom by, uh, say, uh, uh, an atom from the group five, uh, the, the five, fifth column of the periodic table, and then uh, this group five atom, like phosphorus. Phosphorus is the most typical dopant in silicon. So it will make four, four bonds with the silicon uh, lattice, so four covalent bonds, and then there is an extra electron. And this extra electron, uh, at room temperature, this is what is used to dope uh, to, to, because this electro extra electron will go to the conduction band of the silicon. Yeah. So at room temperature, you see that this, what happens is that this, this fifth electron goes to the conduction band and you are left with an ionized bismuth impurity uh, donor, which is like well inserted covalently in the silicon lattice. But at low temperature, uh, this, this actually energy scale here between uh, the, 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 say the, the level where the electron is trapped and the conduction band is uh, 70 milli electron volt for bismuth donors. So at low temperature, the electron can be trapped again around its impurity. So you have these, uh, say, hydrogen-like uh, systems where you have one charged ion, the, the bismuth in, in this case, uh, ion, with one electron uh, sitting around it, weakly bound, and this is not at all like the same binding as an atom. The, the electron, the wave function is pretty big. It's occupying many, many uh, lattice sites of the silicon. Uh, and so we have this unpaired electron, which is uh, hooked to the ion. So this is, in a sense, this is a zero D quantum dot. Huh? This is all often presented like that. It's, it's a quantum dot. And so uh, now this electron has a Hamiltonian, which is very simple. It has a Zeeman effect, uh, but the, the, actually the bismuth atom has a nuclear spin I. So th this is the spin of this electron, and then I is the spin of the nuclear spin. Uh, so electron spin also has a Zeeman effect, but most importantly, the two have a hyperfine coupling. And bismuth is particular because it has a nine-half nuclear spin, and the hyperfine is pretty big, so 1.47 gigahertz. So you're left with something that looks like a rubidium atom, <laughs> those in the room who are <laughs> interested. And so, yes, so, so this is, you, get, you can of course diagonalize this Hamiltonian and then you are, it's a, it's a uh, 
uh, I think maybe 20 level uh, uh, energy diagram. Uh, so these are the energy levels, and now you can have allowed transitions, not all of course, transitions are allowed. You have selection rules, like in atomic physics. And these are the allowed transitions, basically. And so now, you see that, OK, so, so uh, that's one thing also we liked, uh, especially in the past, that you can work at 7 gigahertz in low magnetic fields. So at, at that time, we, we did not apply big magnetic fields. And so this was nice to us. But more importantly, you also see that some of these transitions, they have points at which the derivative of this transition frequency with magnetic field goes to zero. So this is really this physics uh, of clock transitions. Yes? Um, maybe a neat question, but how do we know that this is derivative is zero in all directions of magnetic fields? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, so, so, so. First thing is that, uh, in fact, it is always uh, zero, especially for, for, for an isotropic system. Let's take an isotropic system. An isotropic system will be sensitive only to magnetic field parallel, magnetic field fluctuations parallel to the field quantization axis. It's, it's just for the simple reason that if you add, you know, if you have a, a strong transverse field and you're adding a small field, if it's parallel, it just adds linearly. But, you know, if it's, if it's perpendicular, it adds quadratically. So the, you know, what counts for an isotropic system is just the, the length. But you see that here, the length varies quadratically. So in the perpendicular direction. But this is a good question. In fact, in some anisotropic systems, it's more complicated. Yes, yes but uh, yes, you have these uh, clock transitions. And so, in fact, here, the, the key thing that is very interesting for this quantum memory idea is that then you can have, uh, in fact, here, the Average magnet, what, what, what this means is that the uh, average value of the magnetic dipole in, uh, is the same in the ground and in the excited state. So basically, this, this means that you are suppressing a lot spin-spin interactions. And so you can go to uh, higher density and still should be able to have long coherence times, T2. Okay, so does it work? Uh, yes, it does. So we, this is an experiment that we did uh, with like we had a, a substrate that was doped with bismuth atoms. This was a, a substrate I have to say uh, that was isotopically uh, enriched in silicon 28. This is a small detail, in fact, for, for this. And then we just had a, a resonator on top. This is again this uh, LC resonator. And then um, and with this uh, system, we can measure the spins that are just below again by this magnetic coupling. And uh, this is, we, we just apply a Han echo sequence, you see, pi over 2 pi, and we measure the echo. And this is the echo decay time as a function of the, uh, the distance between the pi over 2 and the echo to tau. You see that now the decay is actually 300 milliseconds. And here, this is the maximum that we've observed. And this is really, uh, we, we observe it at this field. And you see that uh, as soon, this is corresponding to this clock transition, and as soon as we go away, the T2 goes down quite significantly. Right, so in fact, this is, I think, the longest coherence times measured for electron spins near, near an interface, because these are spins that are really close. They are coupled to a nanostructure, so this is a bit. Uh... So, uh, okay, so this is the, the T2, but now can we use that for a storage? And so this is the, what we did next, was to send, uh, say, very weak microwave fields. Here I have to say these are not uh, single photons. Uh, these are not coming from a qubit. It would be very good to do that, but we, we did not do that yet. We just send very weak microwave fields, called classical fields. Uh, but so we, you know, we alternate the phase, etc. And so we send like uh, 20, I think, uh, pulses. And so uh, we apply and then we wait uh, 100 milliseconds this time. <laughs> we apply the refocusing pulse, and then we see uh, the pulse is coming back. Um, and so, uh, and so yes, we, we really, uh, uh, this time, could store these uh, weak excitations uh, to uh, 100 milliseconds. Uh, and that's thanks to this long coherence time at the clock transition. We. It, it, it seems like. Okay, you're storing the information and then you're waiting until it decays to, to 
get it back, right? Uh, not quite. Yes, yes. Basically, you're right. I mean, it's 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 a memory, so we're doing nothing. I mean, ideally, we, yes, we, we would like to store it as long as possible, and uh, and yes, it uh, it has decayed. But in fact, the, the decay is not due to T2 huh? because uh, T2 is is actually longer. Here, the you, you so you're right. Huh? This you see that the amplitude here is still much smaller than here, but here the. the it is smaller not because uh, of loss of coherence. It is smaller because the absorption was lower in this in this experiment. So we we, we had much lower ex absorption than in the previous experiment that I showed, uh, and this is this is really the limiting factor uh, in this still, experiment. Yeah, you're still applying a pi over two poles in the end, right? Yeah, th there is just a pi pulse here. The refocusing here, I I ah yeah, sorry, here I apply a pi pulse. Here, uh, it's, it's called refocusing. So here I apply the refocusing at 59 uh, milliseconds, okay? 59 milliseconds, I apply, uh, say, four microsecond pulse, and then I wait, and then 50 milliseconds after, we see the, the echoes coming out. I suppose, ideally, you would like to, like here you're waiting, but then ideally you would like to be able to just extract that information Demand, yes, on demand, absolutely. Yeah, so the, you're absolutely right. Here, this is just a beginning for a real operational quantum memory protocol. If you really want for a memory protocol, you would, as you say, you would like to store it, keep it uh, as, as long as possible uh, memory, and then uh, retrieve one state on demand, entangle it with another, store it back, etc. This is possible, huh? there are ways to do it. If you use frequency tunable resonators, etc., you can do a lot. And uh, we, are, we are actually now working on, uh, towards that. Yes. Uh, is the scale on when you retrieve the pulse also the same, the one on the y-axis? So, no. I importantly, this is times 25. Huh? Yes, yeah, so this, this is 25 smaller than this. Sorry, I didn't uh, say it. Uh, but this is important. So you see the efficiency is 10 to minus 3. 10 to minus 3 is 1 over 25 squared. So the efficiency in energy. So you, you send one, if you would send one photon, you would get 10 to minus 3 photons. But it's not due to decay. Huh? It's really due to the fact that, in fact, when you send one photon, uh, 0.99 are actually reflected. <laughs> they are not absorbed. And this was because the density was not uh, low, high enough in this experiment. But still, and we are absolutely sure that even if we would go to high, higher dens density so that we would really absorb well the pulses, uh, the coherence time would be as long. And this is thanks to this clock transition uh, say, behavior. And this T2 time, what is limiting it now? Is it like higher order of magnetic field? Yes, that's a very good question. So here we are nearly, we have good evidence that here, the limiting factor for these 300 milliseconds is actually charge noise. Charge noise couples to the hyperfine, so it can change slightly the hyperfine coupling and therefore the energy levels. And, uh, and I have to say, here, 300 milliseconds is just one Han echo. So it is well known in spin physics that you can do dynamical decoupling. So basically, there is no limit. This, is, this, is, this can be stored for many seconds. It's no problem. Uh, the, the difficulty is really to get this high absorption, and so the, for us the next step would be to increase the absorption and then uh, go towards really demonstration with a qubit of this. Like you know, we've we've shown like little pieces of this, and then we could put all that together at some point. Yes. All right. So, was there some question on this part? Because then I will now. Uh, slightly change a uh, topic so this is this was about like this uh, long term storage of microwave pulses and here uh, i think we we demonstrate i mean 100 milliseconds is really like three orders of magnitude longer than the longest uh, qubit coherence times and so now i'd like to switch to uh, one last question. yes so Right now, you know, weak coherent pulses are the easiest. Huh? So this is what we do. But the real goal would be to do it with states coming from superconducting qubits. Huh? That's, that would be the real interest. Uh, you, you would have the memory. So the, the kind of the vision is that, uh, I did not have time to really expl express it, but the vision is that this spin ensemble can be a very long-lived register of many degrees of freedom. You can store thousands of qubit states in it. 
And so the dream is that you have this enormous register that you can access. You don't need a wire per, per, per qubit, because you, you, even with a two qubit processor and this thousand qubit memory, you could, you could have the equivalent of a thousand qubit quantum computer, but just with a two qubit processor. So it would be fun. So it's like kind of this quantum Turing machine idea. Like, you know, you would, to do a gate, you would take a state, put it back in the processor, entangle it, and then put it back, etc. And, and it actually uh, has some interest. So there were theoretical works showing that, uh, yes, it has an interest. If you can do this, this is interesting for quantum computing. I mean, we are not there yet. This is not, we are not so far, but it's not yet the demonstration. But at least we put together some building blocks. Absolutely. This is very, very linked to optical quantum memories. In fact, the protocols that we wrote, they are inspired by optical quantum memory protocols. Absolutely. But the vision is a bit different for us because at microwave frequencies, the, the interest is to, is to uh, interface it with superconducting qubit processor. So it's more in this spirit that we are doing. Yes. Is it okay? All right. So... Now, uh, let's come back to individual spins and like really this kind of vision that these spins are isolated and are interacting with this resonator. And so uh, there, are, there is something that I did not say when I said, okay, we are in this, uh, with this magnetic coupling, we are in the weak coupling regime. But yes, remember that in the weak coupling regime, we also have an impact of, uh, you know, a resonator, we have this system where we have our spin system, so it's coupled with uh, strength G to a resonator, which is damped with a uh, rate kappa. So there we go, we have again this concept of induced dissipation, right? By the bath via this, this resonator. So there we go, again, same formula. I, I showed it in the case of two bosonic modes, but it applies exactly the same way as a spin two-level system coupled to a bosonic mode uh, damped. So it's, it's the same formula. And so there is dissipation induced by the resonator onto the spin at a radiative rate, kappa r, which is given by this, 4g squared over kappa again. And then you have this, like, uh, you know, damping factor that says that this rate is only effective when the spin and resonator are on resonance. Uh, delta is the spin resonator frequency difference. So, okay, so uh, can we see this uh, dissipation induced and can we, is it interesting? Well, actually, this is called the Purcell effect. This was predicted by Purcell and was the beginning of cavity uh, quantum electrodynamics in 46, let's say. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, we, we have uh, done an experiment. So the Purcell effect has been seen on many systems and this is not a new topic. But on spins, it ha we were the first to observe it. Uh, this was in 2016, and we observed it with exactly this type of, of devices. We have this, again, the substrate containing some spins. Here we do, did it with, again, bismuth donors in silicon, typically 10,000 bismuth donors in silicon coupled to the, this resonator. And uh, so with uh, Audrey Bienfait at the time, what we, what we observed is that we measured the, the T1 time of the spins as a function of their detuning to the resonator, and we saw a, an enormous drop when the, the, spin, the spins are resonant with the resonator here at zero megahertz. And then, uh, so here we, we, T1 would go to one second. And then when we would detune by two megahertz, T1 would go to 1,000 seconds. So very, very strong resonant effect. So this is, of course, this induced dissipation in the spins, right? So the, the fact that the spins, the, the, the T1 of the spin is so shortened means that here the dominant relaxation channel is by emitting microwave photons by spontaneous emission. This is the dominant relaxation channel. And this is unusual for spins, and here we were the, the, the first to observe it. And this fit here has no adjustable parameter. Only adjustable parameter is actually the, the non-radiative damping rate. At some point, it stops increasing and so on. So that's the kappa s, if you want. This spin is also coupled to some spin, rad, spin decay channel, which is, in fact, phonons in the substrate and so but this kappa s rate is like 10 to minus 3 per second for bismuth in silicon so yeah th this is this very simple uh, theory and formula 
So now let's ask ourselves. So here we, we, we just observe this effect by looking at the effect on the spin, on the T1 of the spins. But then the question that we asked is, but wait a minute. Here in this situation, this means that every time a spin relaxes, it will emit a photon, a microwave photon through this line, right? But we've not detected these photons so far. And maybe it would be cool to detect them. And yeah, so we should, we should try that. This is interesting. And so uh, then this motivated, so the, the problem for detecting these photons is that these are incoherent photons. They are emitted randomly. And so uh, what you need, and in optics is well known, I mean, it's not a problem you have. A, if you want to look at fluorescence of an atom, you would just uh, hook a, a, a single photon detector, right? And you just buy it and you get it and you measure. But uh, single microwave photon detectors, they do not exist. So we had to develop one. We call this SMPD, uh, and, and, and this is what we did. And so uh, now I'm, I'm going to explain uh, uh, quickly this, the principle of this uh, SMPD and show how we can use it to detect the, the, the Purcell photons emitted by the spins. And so uh, the building block of this SMPD is, uh, again, a superconducting transmont qubit. So this is just a recap of uh, transmont qubit junction coupled to a, a capacitor, and uh, this is this anharmonic uh, uh, resonator and with, based on this nonlinear inductance, and we can measure it very efficiently, zero and one, so this is, this is easy, okay? So this is what Andreas uh, has used in a, like a many qubit chip. But for the SMPD, it's uh, simpler, we, we, we just use one qubit. And so the, the principle of our SMPD was invented by uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Emmanuel Fleurin, and, and so th this, this field of, uh, of developing microwave photon detection has been active for, for uh, uh, in the recent years, and here is our design, but there are many references, uh, and, and so, but I will focus on, on our design, which actually was demonstrated by uh, Raphael Lescan uh, under the supervision of, uh, of Emmanuel. And so uh, our approach is to uh, actually use, again, uh, so one qubit coupled to two resonators, one of them being connected to the, 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 the coaxial line where the photons will arrive. Remember that now we are interested in detecting photons that eat inherent photons. So we really want to, this is really the analogous of an de optical detector. We just want to look at what's coming out, uh, coming uh, f uh, into the coaxial line. Right? So imagine from time to time you have a photon here. So we want to detect it. And so we have our qubit, it's coupled to, uh, I mean, the, 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 the line is coupled to a resonator at frequency omega a, which itself is coupled to a qubit, and itself is coupled to another resonator at frequency omega b. And we uh, activate some coupling, some four-wave mixing process via a pump tone. And uh, this pump tone, uh, actually, what it does is to... Uh, uh, activate, so if, if, we, if we pump this uh, qubit at uh, this condition that we, the sum of uh, omega a and omega p is equal to the qubit frequency and the buffer mode frequency, then what you can have is that every time a photon arrives, uh, one, the photon incoming together with a pump photon can be converted into a qubit excitation plus one photon in this extra B mode. So this is, a, in a sense, a four-wave mixing process that is uh, activated by a strong pump tone. And, and so, uh, uh, but now th this process itself is, is reversible, so this is not so great because uh, then, you know, you, if you would just have this coherent interaction, you would also send back the photon. So uh, then you need dissipation. And if you have dissipation uh, uh, in, this, in this buffer mode, uh, then for some, if you match the rates, again, this is uh, again a matter of uh, matching the rates at which the photons are absorbed and are uh, emitted in the bath. If the two are matched, then you can have perfect photon conversion from mode A to mode B, but you have also excitation of the qubit when doing that. And this, the qubit then is only a flag because then you can read the qubit. So this idea is that, so to, sum, to summarize, what we do is we have an effective coupling between uh, the, 
the transmission line here and the transmission line that goes out that is parametrically pumped by the qubit and that is if, if we match if we match the coupling right uh, that can be 100% efficient like we we transmit each photon that arrives is converted at this frequency uh, but in doing this conversion there is a qubit excitation and the qubit excitation is there forever so then we have time to read it out okay it's a bit uh, yeah, it's, it sounds a bit crazy but it works very well huh? because I mean qubits work really well that's that's the message and so uh, and these parametric processes work very well with superconducting qubits so this is a demonstration that this four-wave mixing uh, actually works so this is um, here is plotted the probability of finding the qubit in the excited state as a function of pump amplitude and pump frequency and uh, and here we send some tone at the frequency of this mode omega a and we see that uh, then we have some areas where the the qubit is excited this area actually the, the frequency depends on the pump amplitude because there are some stark shifts of the qubits this is a detail but uh, otherwise there is a, a large area where the qubit is excited but then if we if we stop sending photons here and we keep the same pump we have absolutely nothing so we see that the qubit excitation is really conditioned to this incoming of a photon here right so okay so this is encouraging uh, let's make it really more uh, uh, let's study it a bit more detail so first there is a bandwidth right so you just can measure the bandwidth by varying the, the frequency bandwidth is typically uh, 600 kilohertz here and uh, and this is the the, the device uh, the device design uh, uh, yes, uh, maybe I won't enter too much into details uh, for the experts. Uh, there is a, the qubit is coupled. This is the input uh, photons. Uh, the, the, the input resonator is coupled to the line via a Purcell filter. And then, uh, so importantly, we can tune the, the input resonator. So this, is, so this is actually important. So here, you know, this is a detector. Now, the detector frequency is fixed by this, the frequency of this resonator. So it is important that we can tune this resonator to the frequency that we are interested in because this is fixed by another device that is like far away in the fridge. So this we do by having a, a squid in the input resonator and we can tune it over again a few hundred megahertz. So this means that any single photon, any photon source in this area, we should be able to tune the detector to detect it. Right, so this is a bit technical, I will not... Uh, but now what I want to explain is, is the, how the, 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 the detection cycle actually works. So this is a three-step process. Huh? We have, and, and that we repeat, that is repeated cyclically. So when we, during the detection time, we just uh, turn on the, the pump. That's the only thing that we do. We have this pump on. And then imagine a photon arrives in the input resonator. Photon arrives, it is converted by the pump into a photon in the output resonator that leaks out very rapidly through this port. But together with this leaking out photons, we have a qubit excitation. And now qubit excitation is very long lived because T1 is long. And so it, it will stay there. This is our flag, this is our signal. So then we, 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 we measure that. This is, I think we do typically 10 microseconds uh, window. Then we stop and we read out the qubit state. And so this, we read out via this output resonator. So we send the, this is the standard uh, qubit readout. So we, we, we read it out here. And then we actually actively reset the qubit because we don't want to lose time by just waiting that it comes back to its ground state. So we actively put it back in the, in the ground state. I will not explain. It's not. But this is the, the average cycle, 12.5 huh? microseconds. And 80% duty cycle is 80%. So we detect during 80% of the time. All right, so does it work? Well, this is the result. So here we, we apply this cycle for a second. In fact, it's been months that it's operating continuously in our, in our fridge, really. And so we get clicks like that. Uh, and so uh, this is when uh, we don't send any signal, but we can also uh, check that it works, you know, when we send a little bit of a signal, more and more, etc. And And so we, we get clicks. 
But uh, we have ways to calibrate uh, all this, and we, uh, we, we can uh, show that uh, the total efficiency is actually like typically 40%, so it is, is not so bad. And very importantly is the dark count rate. This is the key parameter for us. Uh, and this dark count rate, we are very proud that we can achieve 100 per second. So this is really uh, very low. This was, uh, uh, it was uh, and it's, it's really a key for, for what we can do with it. All right? And this is just to show that uh, you can operate it for a long time. This is a whole uh, night. Huh? And so you see that uh, counts per second. So we just measure without sending anything. Uh, and we have uh, just, uh, and we see a little bit of heating, etc. And, and there are some fluctuations. But overall, you can operate it for uh, hours. No problem. All right, so now let's use this uh, de new detector to look at these uh, spontaneously emitted microwave photons. Uh, as, as I uh, proposed, right? So we have now our detector. We have our spins coupled to this cavity. And then uh, what we do is we just apply a pipers. Pipers flips the spins. And then we wait. And from time to time, a spin relaxes, emits a photon. Photon creates a click. Okay. And so, and then, you know, if we have an ensemble of spins, then... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the longitudinal magnetization will go down by steps, and we should see uh, clicks, more clicks coming from the spins. And so, uh, number of clicks detected during this, uh, and, and here we should have this uh, decay with the, here, sorry, I changed notation, but here, this I call kappa r, this should be kappa r, right? We, we expect to see this uh, decay rate of the spins in the number of counts. And, and so, and, and we should just see, and how many counts should we have? Well, just as many as there are spins times global efficiency, which is eta. And that's it. And so the standard deviation then is just uh, related to the, if we are dominated by the dark count, you see that this is the noise. And the noise is directly propor proportional to the square root of the dark count rate. So this is the essential parameter for us. And uh, yes, and, and so it actually scales favorably compared to all the other detection methods for spins. I will not enter into detail. So, okay. So, we did a first uh, proof of principle experiment uh, two years ago. This was published last year. Uh, uh, and, and so, we, we did a first proof of principle with bismuth donors in silicon. And here we had an ensemble of, again, 10 to the 4 uh, bismuth donors. And this was with a photon a counter that was actually much worse than the one that we have now. Uh, but here you see that uh, what, this is a single shot trace, and you see that uh, this is a pipers. We apply the pipers at time equals t equals zero, and then we see counts, and we see we have more counts at the beginning than at the end, right? And so you can take many of these traces and then bin it, so just take the average number of counts per bin of time, and plot it as a function of time following the pipers. And if we don't apply pipers, this is the blue curve, it's constant. But if we apply pipers, we clearly see an exponential decay. And this is this per cell uh, photon. So this is really the spontaneous emission from the spins that we wanted to see. OK, so this was a very nice proof of principle. Uh, but now we have really pushed it uh, quite a bit further. And uh, here the idea is, now I will present some uh, results that we, we have since actually a few months. This is really new and unpublished results. Uh, that's here we, we changed system and we optimized the photon counter and we optimized the resonator. And so these are uh, new results. So we changed spin, spin, spin system and now we are uh, studying a lot uh, rarer science in crystal. And uh, we like a lot erbium, and we use a crystal called calcium tungstate. But, uh, but there, are, there is a, an infinity of crystals that are possible, an infinity of ions and paramagnetic impurities. But uh, erbium is, is nice for the following reason. So uh, actually, the ground state of erbium is a, is a 15 half, uh, is a J equals 15 half uh, uh, level. So this is for the free erbium, uh, if you just... Uh, uh, erbium 3 plus, huh? erbium ion 3 plus. If, if in free space, it's a 15 half uh, angular momentum state. But now, when you place it in the crystal, you have uh, the crystal field that splits these uh, 16 levels into eight doublets. 
there is always a remaining degeneracy, and that's due to Kramer's theorem. So there is a lowest doublet of state, and at sub-Kelvin temperatures, this is the only one populated. So this is an effective spin half. But it's an effective spin half with a big angular momentum. And therefore, the, the gyromagnetic ratio uh, is actually quite strong. So this is good for us, because it means we'll get more signal. So when we apply a magnetic field, you see there is a Zeeman effect with this gyromagnetic tensor. And for calcium tank state, uh, there is a, a symmetry axis, that's the C-axis. And the gyromagnetic tensor is, is like that. And, and, and the nice thing is that uh, so th there is a, say a weak axis, which is the symmetry axis, the C-axis. So this is a low value. But then if we apply the field along this axis, we will have a strong coupling on the transverse direction. So this is actually quite nice for us. So this is, a, in a sense, it's kind of a, an electron on steroids, so it's, uh, it's nice. So, and then, you know, what we do is exactly as I said, we have this uh, resonator coupled to the spins, we apply a, a, a magnetic field, we put it at 10 millik, uh, we put a lot of attenuation, 60 dB at 10 millik, and then we have like, a, I think it's more like 20 or 50 centimeters coax, and these are really uh, different boxes. This is in a coil. This is in a, in a solenoid coil. You can apply a big magnetic field. This is magnetically shielded. This is very far. So it's, it's really a detector, right? And so uh, then we do this, uh, again, this uh, experiment that we apply a pulse and we measure uh, the fluorescence with the photon counter. And so this is, again, a single shot trace uh, of this uh, erbium ensemble. Uh, this is the, the click rate as a function of time. And now if we average uh, for a long time, we get again this fluorescent signal. Uh, this is not exponential and it's, not, it's, it's normal because we have a, a, a big distribution of coupling constants and therefore our relax relaxation rate. And we actually understand quantitatively these curves. I don't have time to enter into the detail, but this is, uh, say, this is our signal for detecting speeds. And so, so now we're going to use it to really perform a magnetic resonance detection. And so uh, th this is, for instance, a, a spectrum that we can measure. And so here, what, what we plot is this is the number of counts as a function of magnetic fields. And, uh, and you know, what we see is we see, some, uh, we see some peaks, we see some lines, right? And then we change the angle, and these lines move. And we have other lines appearing. So this is really doing paramagnetic, uh, electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy. Uh, and so this is on, even on a small, so this is a, a, a new sensitive method for doing uh, EPR spectroscopy of a rarest doped crystal. So we, we can identify these, uh, actually most of these lines, this is the erbium that we are looking for. This is actually dysprosium. Uh, uh, and, and this is very likely uh, erbium ions that are in lower symmetry sites. But uh, this is to show that really it's a, it's a spectrometer. We can really, and we, we see things that we don't understand actually. So uh, we can also do a uh, measure the line width of this erbium ensemble. This is still ensemble measurements. And we can compare, so we have played a bit the comparison because we have this other uh, detection method that is more standard with uh, spin echo. And here we had some well-known results that we had measured with a, a, a student. And we can compare the line widths measured by this standard method and the line widths measured by fluorescent detection. And we find that it is consistent. We can also measure the coherence time of these erbium ions. And coherence time is actually quite long. It's 23 milliseconds with just a spin echo. And, and we also find this in this fluorescence detection. All right, so now let's look, go to the most interesting part. And these are our latest data. Uh, that uh, now, so far it was really an ensemble of ions, but what do we need to actually reach this single spin detection regime? Well, kind of a rule of thumb that, you know, would like is that would like the product, you know, the, the detection, one spin will emit one photon and will, it will be detected as a click with pr uh, efficiency eta. So if this number is larger or comparable to the dark count rate, then, uh, then you know we, we, we should we should detect a single spin, and so this this amounts to having a radiative decay rate which is larger than 0.3 10 to the 3 per second. So we let's let's optimize a bit the resonator design to enhance this coupling rate, and so this is what we did. We made a, a resonator, and 
here the, the, key, the key thing is that the, the, now we have a, a much shorter wire, it's like 100 microns, and it's, it's, it's also narrower, so we, we really concentrate the microwave field around this, this, this wire. And so for the spins that are below this wire, basically, anywhere along this wire but just below, like 500 nanometers below, they will be like kind of strongly coupled. And so we apply the B0 along the, this, this is the C axis of the crystal. And when we compute what we expect, indeed we, we expect that all the spins that are 500 nanometers below and uh, below the wire, they should relax with a, a, a time of order one millisecond. And so given the performance of our counter, we should be able to detect individual spins. All right, so let's look what it gives. So first we do uh, the spectroscopy at high power. And so we see a, a resonance line. This is the ensemble. Now, if you look at the number of, of clicks, it's, it goes to, to 12, you see. So uh, we still have an ensemble of ions. And, so, and, and this is because we, we now apply an excitation pulse at, at very high power. But uh, we can also uh, reduce the power. And if we reduce the power sufficiently, we should then really excite only spins that are close. And we should see a really uh, different signal. And so, uh, yes. This is what we see. And here is the, the, now this low power spectroscopy. And these are the time traces that we see. So here we apply the pipers and we look at the fluorescence. We average a lot and we see the fluorescence uh, curves. So you see that this is the, the main line, right? This is this uh, long decay. But you see that if we go away from this line, we have some sharp lines that are like really decaying quite fast and that are very sharp. So now, we can uh, integrate the signal over a certain uh, duration. And if we plot the integrated clicks as a function of, uh, of this magnetic field, what we see is that we have like uh, this, this is the inhomogeneously broadened erbium line. But away from this line, we also have a forest of individual peaks that are very narrow and totally reproducible. And if you look at the number of detected clicks, it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So, you know, it looks like maybe these are individual spins. So let's try to confirm that. And one way to confirm that is actually to, to switch to this region and to apply also another field on the transverse direction. Because, you know, they should move. We should see some, some Zeeman effect. And so uh, this is what we do. And... And this is what we see. Uh, so, so this is uh, th this was so th the graph that I showed was basically just one value of the transverse field by, and here this this were uh, these individual peaks. And now, when we apply the by uh, field, we see that all of them move, and they move in a perfectly uh, co consistent and reproducible manner, and they all move differently. So this is a clear uh, indication that these are uh, really individual uh, ions. And each individual ion has its own gyromagnetic tensor. This is normal. This is what is, what is expected due to uh, local environment of each ion. And so, uh, yes, so this is really uh, a magnetic resonance spectroscopy on, uh, of individual impurities. So it's not yet approved, but it's, uh, th this kind of uh, signals has, have never seen, been seen uh, before, let's say. All right, so let's, uh, let's go a bit further. And uh, you know, we can try to do uh, some time domain uh, measurements. So th this is, by the way, one of these traces. Uh, you see that uh, now this is perfectly exponential signal. Uh, uh, and, so, uh, and, and, and so we can, what we can do is integrate it over, uh, say, first one or two milliseconds. And this signal should be proportional normally to mean value of sigma z, right? This is a two level system normally. And so we should be able to do the usual, uh, say, time domain experiments. And so uh, we can sit on one of these lines and then uh, change the duration of the pulse. And this is a Rabi oscillation in the number of counts. And uh, we can uh, do this, we can uh, measure this uh, Rabi oscillation for various uh, pump amplitude and uh, Rabi frequency scales as it should as a function of the square root of the input power. And so th this means that now we, we can calibrate really a, a pipe pulse huh, because now 
before there was a, a large spread of Rabi frequency, but now we are addressing individual ions, so the, the pi pulse is perfectly defined. The exact pi pulse duration and power depend on the ion that we are looking, but for one def definite ion, it's uh, perfectly defined. And we can look at the signal-to-noise ratio. This is really an important quantity. Uh, and so this is the, the single-shot histogram. So uh, in, in orange, this is the probability to detect zero click, one click, or two clicks over 1.5 milliseconds. So if, if, you, if we don't apply a pi pulse, this is the orange graph. And if we apply a pi pulse, we see that you know, the histogram is, is, is changed. Now we can average this histogram for one second. This is, one second is an interesting uh, time, right? It kind of defines uh, the signal to noise. And you see that these are the, the histograms after one second integration. So we have a signal to noise ratio of one in one second. That's the, the typical value. That we have. So, uh, yes. Uh, we can do G2 measurements. After all, we have a single photon counter. So let's do a G2 measurement first on the background. Uh, let's measure then uh, the, the uh, click rate. The click rate is, is constant huh, if there is no, uh, no pulse. And the click rate conditioned to the detection of a click before. Now for the background, it should be a Poissonian process, so there is no difference. So the heralded click rate is the same as the average click rate. But now when we look at the uh, uh, the signal emitted by the spin, we see a clear anti-bunching. Uh, this is the, the average click rate after a pi pulse in blue, and in orange, this is the average click rate conditioned to the detection of a photo. And here there is clear anti-bunching. Now this anti-bunching we can actually quantify, and, uh, with a, and, and then you know, we can turn it into a, a G2, and the measured G2 is 0.89, but uh, importantly, because we, we know our, our background, we measure it very precisely, so we can do some kind of some background correction, and this is the curve for a perfect emitter in presence of this background, and it fits perfectly with what we observe. So this means that the kind of background corrected G2 of zero is, is really zero. Uh, and this is a proof for single airbion ion detection. I mean, so it's another proof. There are many of proofs. But, uh, right. Okay, so we can do also Ramsey. Uh, Ramsey works. Uh, and what is the, but what is the coherence time that we measure? And this is 300 uh, microseconds. So this is, uh, I mean, this is the longest that we've measured. It's, it's found to vary from ion to ion. And typically we've measured between 10 and 300 microseconds with typical values of 150 microseconds. Uh, we can use the Ramsey to, to change, the, uh, I mean, to measure the spin frequency. And with this, we can actually measure the per cell effect on a single ion. And we see that the T1 changes exactly as it should. Now there is no adjustable parameter. I mean, only one is the coupling rate, that is 3.6 kilohertz. Finally, we can do echo. Uh, echo, the T2 time that we measure is uh, 2.5 milliseconds. So this is long, but actually it's completely limited by the T1. Uh, the T1 is 1.45 milliseconds, so 2 T1 is 2.9 milliseconds. Uh, and, and in fact, if we do uh, just a little bit of dynamical decoupling, we are exactly at 2.9 milliseconds. So it's totally limited radiatively. So uh, yes, so here is my conclusion. <laughs> I, I think I'm done. Uh, yes, I will skip that. Uh, and just uh, acknowledge uh, my students, uh, Ji Jen Wang, Léo Balambois, Eric Billot, uh, Marianne Le Dantec, and uh, Miloš Rancic, and my colleagues, Emmanuel Furin, Denis Vion, Daniel Estève, and, uh, and also uh, all our co workers. And uh, yes, we have uh, positions for those interested. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. So I think, uh, so first we, we, we don't know. First we, uh, this, this detection method is, is very special, I have to say. We detect any Erbium ion 
which is in this 100 micron cube volume. This is enormous. All other single spin methods are extremely close. You need to be extremely close to the spin. So, so we, we can probably most of the spins, most of the atoms that we detect are actually really in the bulk. They are like maybe 300 nanometers below the surface. So we, all, all I can say is that so far we, we really do not see any surface effect, which is not surprising given that we have a very big detection volume. Ah, the reason is that uh, qubits, qubits are long-lived. And so, I mean, the other... Oh, oh, dear, but this is just my scheme. Huh? It's just my drawing. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, it's correlated. It's the same time. Okay. It's just my drawing. Dis-moi. 